And there's Gary's information down below. It's uh, Gary F at WSU.edu and has his phone number also. Okay, why eat blueberries? They're the king of the antitoxidants. Antitoxidants are substances that may protect your cells against free radicals. And we're going to talk a little bit about the free radicals, but not get into them too awful much, just telling you what they basically do. And they're molecules that are produced when the body breaks down your food. Other bonuses from blueberries. You get all kinds of great vitamins from them. A little story about the blueberries and how I got involved in them. Uh, we purchased this property up here. In, in, I'm in Winlock, so I'm a little bit north of Collitz by about 30 to 40 miles. And the property was five acres, and my wife was taking care of it while I was, I was in the service for 30 years, and I retired. But she was up here five years prior to, I, to my retirement. And bought her one of those John Deere lawnmowers, and she was riding around the yard, and she just cut everything and made sure everything stayed nice and clear and clean cut. And needless to say, she was down in the garden area, and she was cutting over the grapes and the blueberries. Didn't really know what they were. So finally, we started, when I got home, I started cart, uh, compartmental, or compartmentizing the property and fencing off the garden area. And notice these bushes started coming up, and here we found out that they were blueberries. And the two plants that she kept running over, they they just came back with a vengeance, and now they're my best producers I've got on the whole property. Okay, so the topics we're gonna to be covering. Yeah. We're going to be covering the climate around Washington, site selection, soil testing, basics about blueberries, types, cultivars, planting, mulching, irrigation, fertilizer, pruning, tools, diseases, insects, vertebrae pests, and harvesting and storage. So we're going to cover a lot of topics. So Western Washington, we've, I've lived here for, since 2005. And the climate here is mostly a maritime. We have the mild wet winters, the wet springs, microclimates, and the very dry summers. So site selection is very important for the blueberries. You have to have water availability during the July and September months when we don't have very much rain. And there's a scale for the uh, Longview area, what the rainfall looks like during the summer months. As you can see, that rainfall is pretty low. And then you want to remove the competing vegetation around the plant. That's the main things that really um, interrupt the growing of the blueberries because of their rooting system. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about the rooting system as we go. Okay, Gary, I think we're ready for the first survey question. We're going to do a few survey questions here. The answers are anonymous. Go ahead and answer as you want. And then just submit when you're done. It is what kind of requirements to blueberries do uh, blueberries require? They need acidic soil, full sun, good air circulation, well-drained soil, or all the above and then just submit. Yeah, and it's yeah, anonymous. anonymous. We'll show you the results here in just a minute. <laughs> okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. Uh, thanks, Gary. All right, they do need acidic soil. They definitely want the full sun, good air circulation, and well-drained soil. So it's all the above was the correct answer for it. 
So your site selection and preparation, your location, full sun can handle the late afternoon shade. You want good air circulation. If the, if the plant gets wet, you want to make sure it gets good air circulation so it dries out. Soil testing. You just need to test your soil about once every two to three years. And that's basically the type of tools you can use to get your soil samples. pH has to be between a 4.5 and a 5.5 for blueberries to flourish. And you need well-drained soils. So that's where you get your answer as being all the above. And there's a little diagram of what happens if your soil doesn't drain properly. So soil testing. If you want to get your soil tested, you take a sample, you send it in. You should do it about every two to three years. The best way to determine where your soil is sitting is to have it tested. And there's laboratories around, but the cheapest I've found so far is called simplysoiltesting.com. And I just checked prices, and the next slide will show those prices. Just remember the most important thing about this analysis that you're getting is you have to understand what the analysis says. So it doesn't matter if you get a sheet of paper and you don't understand what the readings mean. You need to, they usually, when you get the test drawn, usually speak to analysis, an a, a analysis type person and they'll explain the results to you. There are kits out there that can be purchased. I found out this rapid test is one of the best-selling ones out there. However, they're only as accurate as you, uh, the person doing the test. If the chemicals in the test are expired, then your test is going to fail. Uh, they also only give you an approximation of where your soil is sitting. It doesn't give you an accurate reading as if, uh, if you send your soil in for testing. Okay, I told you this is the prices for the soil tests, and if you send it to simply uh, soil testing, there's those prices listed, and then the only thing additional would be the uh, shipping costs. Okay, the rapid, the rapid test, the soil test I told you about, once again, it's not very accurate. It'll just give you a ballpark range. The kit costs you about 10 to $14, and you get 10 tests in that kit. A lab test will be more precise, and they also, the lab test gives you a primary, secondary, and micronutrient levels, where the rapid test only does your, your NPK and your pH. The best thing about the rapid test is the chart that you get in that that kit. It has the pH levels for about 450 plants. And this is what that kit looks like. Okay, we're ready for our second one, Gary. Okay, what type of rooting system do blueberries have? And there's a choice of adventurous roots, creeping roots, deep roots, shallow fibrous roots, cap roots, tuberous roots. Go ahead and pick the one you think is right. There's only one answer, and then submit it. A little slower this time. Everybody, come on, be brave. Nobody's going to know who did who guessed. Take a guess. Okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right, thank you. All right, the type of rooting system. The shallow fibrous roots is the correct answer for this one. And we're going to show some pictures of those, that rooting system as we go through this slide presentation. 
Okay, soil moisture, the preferred soil type. Once again, I said that soil should be about a 4.5 to 5.5 pH level. And what's nice about it, they're similar to azalea and rhododendron. So if you're feeding your azaleas and rhododendron, that will also feed your blueberries. If your pH is too high, you can gradually lower it by using sulfur or ammonium sulfate. Moisture, well-drained soil, we discussed that earlier. Very shallow fibrous roots. So you're best to cover this up with mulch and we'll tell you exactly about mulches as we get into the presentation a little further. Ensure you have ample water during the dry times especially. Okay, some basics, ripening terminology. Uh, you got different types of plants and they're going to ripen at a different time. So it's best to buy a variety. So you can have some plants that will ripen early and that will be around the late July to early or late June to early Julys. Then you can have the mid-season ones that come in around mid-July. And then you can buy the late ones and they come in late to early August. So if you, if you plan it properly, you can have blueberries all summer long. Growing season is approximately 140 days. And there's some of the crop, that what they look like after you harvest. We have, on our property, I have five plants. And my blueberries start producing roughly around, usually around the beginning of July, and they finish up usually around the beginning of August. So I've got them stretched all through the summer. We have five plants. This year we got, this last year, we had over 45 pounds of uh, blueberries. And I'm still eating them now. And I eat smoothies every five days. Monday through Friday, I have a smoothie with blueberries in it. So the blueberries have lasted pretty long. The last year... I didn't net my blueberries. I only ended up with about 10 pounds of blueberries. But since we netted them and put cages around them, that made a huge difference keeping the birds away from them. Okay, blueberry types. These are the ones I was telling you about. And we're ready for our next one, our survey question. Okay, what is the best type of blueberries to grow in the Pacific Northwest? We haven't discussed it yet, but there's uh, one answer that gives you the best type. And go ahead and submit. It could be either, oh, I already deleted it, sorry. It could be either a half high, a high bush, low bush, or a rabbit eye. What do you think is the best? Hey, five seconds. Oh, excellent. Okay, the majority of the people picked out the high bush. The high bush is the correct answer. You can grow other varieties or cultivars, but that high bush is the best one around for the Pacific Northwest. So low bush requires mowing to the ground each year. That's what that plant looks like there. You have a rabbit eye. Southeastern United States turns pink and then blue. Half eye cross between a low bush and a high bush. And then the high bush is ideal for the Pacific Northwest. So we're going to start getting into the different types of cultivars here. The high bush is winter hardy. It's not drought tolerant, so you got to keep it watered. They're very productive. They're usually grown in the commercial and the home gardens. And that's what the high bush basically looks like with the berry type. And here's the tables I was telling you about. The tables are 
listed from the early type uh, blueberry, and then we're going to get into the later or later cultivars. These are handouts that I put in on the handout sheet that everybody can have, and they're excellent if you're going to shop for blueberries and learn which ones you want to buy. The ones that have asterisks are a um, mummy berry uh, resistant. So that's one of the main diseases that you get here on the blueberries. So kind of watch out for those type of uh, uh, cultivars because those are the kind that you want to grow. And they're good tasting, the ones that have the asterisks too. I've got um, early blue. I've got a Spartan. I've got a Jersey and a Dixie are the, are the ones I've got here. And then there's um, one plant I'm not sure what it is because it was here before we bought the place. But here's four here that all um, that are that grow here in the Pacific Northwest very well. And here's some more the Toro, the Olympia, the Blue Crop, the Dixie, the Jersey, and the Blue Ray. So as you can see, there's a lot of varieties that are just fantastic here. And you can grow them from the beginning of the season all the way to the end. And once again, these handouts are available through Gary. So I'm not going to spend very much time on them, but Please, if you do want them, please go ahead and email them. And this is one of the, the best charts that I've seen and I found on the types of blueberries and when they ripen. If you take this one little piece of paper with you when you shop for blueberries, you can pick out the, the cultivars right from the chart and then just uh, pick your choices when you're at the store. But these are a good uh, selection, and you just go right down the line. You want to get, say, you want to get an early blue, and then maybe a jersey, and then go down into a uh, an Elliot or an Aurora, and then you've got just about the whole season covered for blueberry production. That chart's also available in the handouts. Okay, we're going to get into some planting methods. Once again, you want to have these planted in full sun, can handle the late afternoon shade, roughly four to five feet apart and eight feet between the rows. When you buy your plant, there should be a tag on them with recommendations or just ask the person that you bought the plant from if they're a reputable person that understands how to grow blueberries. Just ask them the spacing differences. A lot of times there'll be tags on the blueberries or else if you know the blueberry, just look it up online. Most blueberries are self-pollinating, but it's always better to have two different varieties and you get a better, if you have two different varieties, you get a better size and a better yield. Number of plants, rule of thumb is two per household member. So it's just my wife and I, we've got five. We can't multiply the two by two, so we got to get an extra one. Plant in the early spring, and then just if you plant, you might as well wait for about three years to have good production. Rooting system is very shallow. So whenever you're working on these plants, you want to be careful you don't rake too much around the top surface of the plant area. And there's a picture of the rooting system. And that's why these fibrous roots that are sitting on top of the, uh, just below the ground surface there, that's what you want to keep covered up with the mulch. Okay, planting some more. Old adage, a $5 hole for a $1 plant. Plant high enough to allow for soil settling. 
So you just want to dig your hole out. You want to be careful when you're digging with a shovel. If you get smooth surfaces on your uh, hole, I recommend just using a, a pitchfork and, and roughing up those edges quite a bit. You don't want to have a bowl down there after you dug your hole. If you have clay soil, break the sides up with a he with a heavy garden fork, and that'll promote the root growth and avoid root girdling. So that's what I was saying about breaking it up real well with a, a fork, a garden fork, or a pitch fork. And you just don't want to have those smooth surfaces so the roots can expand out. Once again, well-drained soils. Okay, we said we were going to talk about a little bit about mulching. So two to three inches immediately after planting, keeping the crown clear. So what that means is you want to put mulch two to three inches around the blueberry, but you want to keep it away from the base of the plant. Keep that area clear so you don't smother the plant out. Spread out past the drip line approximately, make a four foot circle. Stuff to use, sawdust, dug fur, fur needles, arborist chips. And what this does, is it preserves your moisture and deters weeds. As your plants mature, you want to keep on adding your mulch, four to six inches. Mulch will then generally generally will decompose at a rate of about one inch per year. So it decomposes pretty rapidly. And that's what your plants should look like after you mulched. Okay, we're ready for our next question, Gary. All right, what is the best type of irrigation for blueberries? You got the choices of drip irrigation, hand watering, overhead watering, or water hoses. Hey, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right, thank you. All right, 82% of the people said drip irrigation. That's the correct answer, drip irrigation. So after planting, water the plants to allow the soil to settle around the roots. Initially, you want to keep that root zone and soil thoroughly wetted until the roots are established. But you don't want to have it so wet that you have standing water. Yeah. Established bushes need about 1.5 to 3 inches of water per week, especially the June during the, uh, during the June and August time frame when the rainfall is very absent. Brown leaves indicate watered stressed plants. Avoid overhead watering so you prevent diseases in case the plants don't dry out. That's kind of hard when it's raining all the time, but don't add to the problem. And drip, drip irrigation is the best method. So drip, what drip irrigation does for you, it just uh, localizes the water. Um, you're not watering weeds, you're watering the plant, and you're not um, getting the whole plant wet. So that's the idea behind drip irrigation, and you're conserving water. So it makes it a lot easier and it's more efficient. All right, fertilization. This is a key to your blueberries also, big key. Your primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. So your nitrogen greens up plants. Your phosphorus reaches down to the roots and helps produce blooms. And your potassium promotes all around well-being. So anytime you see these numbers, the easiest way to remember them 
is to think up, down, and all around. So the nitrogen does the leaves, the phosphorus does the roots, the potassium is the all well-being. That's like the circulatory system of a plant. pH is another important factor, that 4.5 to 5.5. And this is your alkalinity and acidic scales. Neutral is 7, so you want to be on the lower end of that scale. Okay, fertilizer, when you see fertilizer, what do the numbers mean? This is important because a lot of people get confused on these numbers, so we're going to cover them real brief here. So if you go to a store and you see a 510-10, and it's in a 10-pound bag, so your nitrogen was 5, so that's 0.5 pounds of nitrogen in that bag, a half a pound. Your phosphorus is one pound. If you multiply it out, it comes out to one pound. Your potassium, it's another pound. So for a total of two and a half pounds of nutrients going to the plant. So you still have a remainder of that 10 pounds of 7.5. So that other remainder is going to be anything that's inert, sawdust, sterile dirt, peat moss, ground corn cobs, other stuff that are used for fillers to give you that extra weight. So that stuff's all inert. It doesn't do anything to the plants at all. Okay, we're ready for our next one. Gary? All right, which type of fertilizer feeds the plant faster, inorganic or organic? Okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right, we had about a 50-50 on this. 52% said or inorganic and 48% said organic. All right, we're going to find out real quick here. So the easiest way to explain the difference between organic and inorganic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers are natural and break down to feed the microorganisms in the soil and finally feed the plants. So the soil organisms are going to break that fertilizer down and then the plants are going to feed from that. Example of organic fertilizers include manure, your poultry, your cow, your horse, your alpaca, your rabbits, uh, bone meal, cotton seed, or any other natural occurring materials. And you can buy it if you don't have it already on the property. Inorganics are man-made products and feed the plant directly. They usually have a higher nutrient content. So if you want, if you have a stress problem on your plant and you want to get that plant immediate help, you want to use an inorganic fertilizer to take care of the problem quickly. However, you need to follow the instructions so you don't end up burning the plant. So you have to be careful when you're using fertilizers. Make sure you measure everything and go by the instructions on how much to put down for each plant. And then as we said, the fertilizer numbers are a little different. As you can see, they're a little higher on the inorganics vice the organics. Okay, when you're fertilizing, avoid using fertilizer for the first year on newly transplanted blueberries. This will avoid burning and the developing root system and will allow the roots to expand and begin to explore the soil. Also, if you plant new blueberry plants, you want to make sure you don't let them produce that first year. You want to make sure that the rooting system develops and then 
go ahead and let your plants go ahead the, the following year, not that first year. When fertilizing, keep your fertilizer approximately two inches away from the crowns so it doesn't do any damages and burn the, the, the bush itself. If using sawdust, use a higher nitrogen to prevent leaf yellowing. So the sawdust is going to drain that nitrogen out or draw that nitrogen out, and you want to make sure that you use a little higher nitrogen to get to the bush. So if your leaves start turning yellow, add a little bit more nitrogen, then it'll green up on you, but just don't overdo it. Follow the instructions on the fertilizer bag. And we're going to give you some amounts here, too, as we're going through this lesson. If leaves start turning brown, you want to cut back on the amount of fertilizer. Then you're, get, you're over fertilizing. If you're using an ammonia sulfate or any type of other fertilizer, you can also dilute the stuff, not dilute it, but dissolve it in water and then apply it to the plant. And that helps it uh, break down easier. Or you just add the granules down on the soil, spread them out, and then water heavily. And then what I usually do is I usually add mulch on top. So just sprinkle it around roughly, you know, try to get it as even as you can and spread it around the, the, the whole plant going all the way out to the drip line. And then after you put those granules down, make sure you give it a good drink of water. And here's some examples of fertilizing. There's your 51010. There's your ammonium sulfate. 2100, that's like a straight shot of nitrogen. And then there's a Lily Miller Azalea Rhododendron food. Okay, fertilizing. This chart here is also in your um, handouts. And as you can see, the first year, you're breaking it down into three dosages. It says here that you uh, March 15th to April 15th is your first dose. Your second one is May 20th, and your third dose is June 15th. What I usually do on my blueberries, and it works out really well, so I don't have to memorize dates, I go when I prune the blueberries, usually um, I haven't pruned mine yet. I'm going to prune them probably within the next week or so. So I get my first pruning in, and I'll give them its first, give them their first dose of fertilizer. Then I go on Mother's Day, which is close to the May 20th, and then my next dose is usually on Father's Day, which is roughly around the June 15th time frame. So I go when I prune, Mother's Day, Father's Day, and then I don't have to remember dates so much. But as you can see, as the plants get older, they're going to want more and more fertilizer. So those are your three doses broke down. That's in accordance with the Washington State University pumped on blueberries, and it's also in the uh, training manual that is put out for the master gardeners. And here's another type of fertilizer. If you want to just use ammonium sulfate, here's the amounts, and this is also from uh, Washington State. And they say put it in April, May, and June. So pretty much the same time frames. If you look down below, it has your dormant time frame as January to March. Your bloom time frame is April to May. And your crop is usually, it's usually about the end of June to mid-September, depending on your cultivar. Okay, now we're going to get into the pruning. Okay, your plants will need very little pruning in the first three years of their life. So that's the nice thing about these plants. When you plant them, you don't have to do too much with them because they're usually pruned from the nursery you get them from or they're too young and they're not growing very much. You're trying to get those roots to establish. Okay, your top buds are your fruiting buds. And your bottom buds are your vegetative buds. And there's a picture. As you're looking at a, a branch, your top, your top buds are your fruiting ones. Your bottom ones are your vegetative buds. And you can see, if you're looking at them, 
the size difference between the buds. The top buds are definitely, the fruiting buds are bigger than the small leaf buds or the vegetative buds that are down below. Okay, when you prune, it's going to pr promote the health of the plant by getting air circulation and light into the plant. And it also helps increase the berry production and quality and size because the nutrients are going to go where it needs to go. Minimizes overgrowth. And what you want to remove initially is you want to remove all damaged dead, diseased, and dysfunctional. And when I'm talking about dysfunctional, I'm talking about crossing, interfering, or old branches. And you'll be able to look at the different colors of the branch to tell what I mean by old. Uh, the, new, the new branches are usually a reddish color, and you want to keep those, and you want to look at the plant and make sure that you have more of that uh, reddish color branch than you do the old, darker colored branches. On mature plants, you want to prune out low spreading branches near the ground first. So you want to take care of the ones that are closest to the ground first. Then you want to head back the top with little vigor. And you want to get rid of some of those twiggy branches that aren't going to be producing very much. Older plants, remove one inch diameter branches at the ground, branches at the ground level. And then you want to always leave about 6 to 12 branches. Early spring is when you want to prune. Remove the old and the dead branches, the tan or the black in color. You want to keep the madrone, the burnt orange, reddish colored branches as they provide the most berries. And prune to get good airflow. So you want to watch your bush. Your bush is going to let you know what to prune and what not to prune. But if you watch it, just pay attention to it, and you'll see the different colors of the branches. So here's a bush that has been before and after pruning. And as you can see, they've pruned away some of the branches on the bottom, and they left uh, approximately six branches going up. And they got rid of some of the uh, twiggy branches up on top and minimized it out for everything. So they thinned it out a little bit. And then fruits on the last year's growth. So make sure you don't take last year's growth off so the you get fruit on the uh, bush this year. Okay, the type of tools. Okay, we're ready for our last survey question, Gary. Okay, which type of pruners are a better choice for pruning, anvil or bypass pruners? And just click one and submit. Okay, hey, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right, thank you. Okay, 78% chose bypass. Bypass is the correct answer. All right, pruners and loppers, different types of photos I found on them. You have the bypass, and that's when the blade actually bypasses the second blade and gives you a nice smooth cut. And there's a picture of the loppers that are bypassed. And then you have the anvil type. You still see these in stores. And all they do is end up, they've got an anvil and the blade comes down on top of the anvil and makes the cut. And you can buy them in uh, lopper style too. Okay, the cuts. Here's, where, here's why they don't recommend to use um, anvil type pruners. And we're going to show you what, what the difference is on the cuts. If you're using a bypass pruner or lopper, if you look at the diagram here, the picture, you can see where the crush zone is on the bypass pruner and how that blade goes down and just passes, bypasses that anvil. 
so it gets it gives you a nice straight cut and it doesn't crush your branch and the part that does hit the crush zone is discarded so that's why they recommend the bypass pruners over anvil pruners and that's recommended by Washington State University also if you look at the anvil type cuts you'll see as the branch is uh, set across the anvil that blade comes down and you have it goes right across that crush zone and ends up crushing the branch especially if the blade is not sharp so you end up crushing that branch and causing damage to it so that's why anvil pruners are not recommended or loppers all right also there's a proper way to use the pruner if you cut the if you're using the bypass type pruners you want to make sure the bypass is closest to the trunk of the the uh, plant and the anvil is going to be or the uh, crush zone area is going to be on the outside of the branch you're going to get rid of so there's no chance of crushing it if you turn it upside down you're going to end up with a stub and you're going to end up with a crush zone that's going to be left so you don't want to do that mainly the stub is going to be there so make sure you hold the pruners right and make sure they uh, you get a nice smooth cut and make sure they're sharp and disinfected and we're going to cover that next Some more on tools. You need a sharpener. Different ways to sharpen. You got files. You got sharpeners you can purchase. And the files you need, you're going to need a coarse fine and an extra fine. I usually just go with the fine and the extra fine. If I have to use a coarse, it's usually because I have a nick in there and I'm trying to take a nick out. But not too often do I get nicks in my pruners, so I usually just stick with the fine and extra fine. And I usually just carry them with me. So if I do need to do a quick sharpening on them, it's very easy. I just run them across, make sure I only go one way on it so the blade works uh, properly when you're cutting. You're going to use a disinfectant, alcohol, 70% or better. You can use a 10% Clorox solution. However, it's corrosive on the metal. Um, don't like using the Clorox, I'd much rather use the alcohol, or you can use a wipe, an antiseptic wipe. You need gloves, especially when you're sharpening, and lubrication. You want to make sure you keep your tools lubricated and keep them preserved also. WD-40 dry lube or um, Felco is made by a... Uh, a company that makes pruners. Okay, we're going to get into a few of the diseases. Uh, mummy berry is a big one for blueberries. It's a fungal disease, and it, it leaves the fruit looking like uh, just like a hard kernel. Um, you want to make sure that if you do get mummy berries, you pick the fruit away, discard it, get it away from the plants, and uh, make sure you have a good cleanup. And get rid of any blighted shoots and good spring raking, good cleanup after the crop is done. And that's what mummy berry looks like. Whoops. Oh, come on. Botrytis. Blossom blight. It's a fungal disease. It's your gray mold. And that's when you do your overhead watering or the heavy rains we get in Washington and you don't have good air circulation through the plants and it doesn't dry the plant up, you end up getting this gray mold on your uh, blueberries. Insects, type of, type of insects that bother the blueberries, you get aphids. cherry fruit worm larva and root weevils 
If you get any of these, just call our plant and insect clinic or get in touch with them. We can tell you the preventive measures or go to HortSense from Washington State University or PestSense, and it'll tell you the um, – they, they give you traditional or um, chemical and non-chemical type treatments and just follow the instructions. If you ever use any kind of pesticides or anything like that, just follow the instructions on it, on the bottle. And there's your root weevil. Pests, biggest problem are the birds. My bird, my my production increased probably by 60 to 70 percent by netting, and I ended up putting cages actually around them so I could just open them up and leave the netting all year round, and that worked out really well. I take it down every year so the snows don't um, overweight it and crush it. Uh, a lot of we had problems this year. A lot of people lost their netting in their cages because of the snow. But I just take mine down. I got um, PVC piping going around mine, and I just put it in the ground, and I net around them and cover them, and that protects them all summer long. And then when the crop is done, I take it all down and uh, put it away for the next year. Uh, deer like the blueberries also. Best uh, netting won't stop a deer if they want to get in there, but you might want to use a cage. Works better. Harvesting and storing. Uh, four to five years old, years old before bearing well. So your plants are really going to start producing after your four to five year mark. That's when they're considered mature. Several signs of maturing, when the birds are eating them, your, your blueberries are probably pretty much ready to go. <clears throat> the color changing, when they're getting that blue color, you want to start picking. Taste, and you can use a ref, uh, refractometer on a refractometer, excuse me. The refractometer is uh, red. It's got a brick scale on it. Increments mean one gram of sucrose per 100 grams of solution. And it doesn't really tell us much, but when you're reading a 7 on the scale, it's poor. 9 is average. 12 is good. 15 is excellent. So you just read up that scale. When it shows you the, the line there where you're good or excellent, then that's when your blueberries are ready to go. Harvest four to five days after the first berries turn blue. And then fresh berries have a two-week shelf life when refrigerated. And you can freeze them. So just freeze the berries individually, then put them in a bag and just store them all until you're ready to use them. All right, in summary, we covered the climate, site selection, soil testing, basics, types, cultivars, planting, mulching, irrigation, fertilizer, pruning, tools, diseases, insects, vertebrae pests, and harvesting and storage. Is there any questions? Oh, here's my references I used, and those are also in the handouts. And you can get to any of the hyperlinks there that I have listed from or just type them in when you get the handouts.